Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this week's Lunch and Learn. I'm Tony Ross, Director of Marketing Communications at Provalis Research. Um, before we get started um, with uh, Derek Cogburn today, um, I, I would like to remind you that if anybody on this call, and I know we have a lot of uh, experienced people on this call, I recognize many of your emails, um, if you would like to present or you have a paper or you have a way that you use that that you use the software that you think would be instructive to other to to other people, uh, please get in touch with us. Um, we are hoping to schedule a couple of more lunch and learns before the holidays, um, and then we're going to be starting with a new schedule, probably in mid January for the winter winter schedule. So please get in touch with us. You have my email. Tony.ross at ProvalisResearch.com. You should have it when I, I sent you all the invitations. So please get in touch with me or you can contact us through the website. Today's presentation is deductive text and uh, analytics using categorization models for confirmatory approaches. Dr. Derek Cockburn has extensive experience with QDA minor and WordStat. He will introduce you to categorization models a powerful deductive approach for text mining. These approaches help to identify the extent to which a specific concept is present or absent with large, within large scale textual data sets. De Derek has 10 plus years working with QDA Miner and WordStat. He is a professor of information technology and analytics, Kogod School of Business, American University. He's also a professor of international communications and international development, School of International Service, American University. Derek teaches graduate seminars on, on big data analytics and text mining using ProSuite and RStudio. He has coordinated multiple United Nations workshops, side events on text mining and international affairs, sustainable development goals, and CRPD implementation. Derek has published multiple articles and conference papers on text mining. He's president and CEO, managing member of Praxis Analytic LLC, offering consulting services in data and text analytics. Um, his inf his uh, information, contact information is on the screens, but if for some reason you don't get it, you can always contact me and I can uh, send it to you as well. At the end of the presentation, if you wish to ask questions, please send them to us through the chat feature on the right-hand side of the screen. We'll take as many as time allows. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Derek. Thank you very much, Tony. I appreciate that. I always enjoy gathering together with uh, this crowd. Um, as you said, uh, there are a number of people here that um, uh, are familiar with the software, and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing some of the um, techniques and tools that we use in the Pro Suite to uh, do some confirmatory work uh, on some of the areas that are of interest to us. So. Um, you know, this is a very uh, exciting time for us. I think um, everybody around us is aware of how much text data is available now, um, how you know, increasingly we're being uh, bombarded with lots and lots of opportunities for text data. So I'm delighted that more and more people are starting to uh, become comfortable with text mining and uh, that Provalis has made um, that entry point to text mining uh, so accessible. And so I want to thank uh, Dr. Peladu and, and all of the colleagues at uh, uh, Provalis for being able to make this uh, uh, software available um, to everyone. So there are four things that I want to uh, talk about today, and I really want to focus on the, the, the last two. So the first is I'll say just a little bit about some of the spaces that we work in uh, related to uh, internet governance and big data analytics and some of the text uh, that's coming out of that uh, environment. And then I'll talk a little bit about the uh, broad project strategy that we use to manage uh, a, a big text mining project. Um, so I'll introduce uh, the crisp DM approach, um, the cross industry standard uh, process for data mining uh, as it's applied to text mining. And then I'll talk uh, the meat of what I'd like to talk about is to really uh, introduce you to kind of a standard uh, approach that we take uh, for a lot of our projects, um, doing some exploratory work. Um, so once we get uh, a large data set, we uh, uh, have some techniques that we use to explore um, that data set uh, and through inductive techniques. But more importantly, uh, when we uh, want to confirm um, certain hypotheses or we want to confirm certain 
um, uh, issues or, or that are of interest to us, we take uh, deductive approaches. And here I'll highlight um, one of the, for me, uh, kind of flagship areas of the Provales Pro Suite. And this is uh, uh, categorization models. And I'll, I'll talk about building uh, multi-level uh, complex categorization models or dictionaries, uh, as well as using some existing dictionaries uh, as well. And then I'll say a little bit about applying some of these techniques to uh, 12 years of transcripts with the uh, Internet Governance Forum, which is, uh, I think, uh, exemplary of some of the ways in which these tools can be used. So that's, that's my plan for the next uh, 35 uh, minutes or so. So first, in terms of internet governance research. So internet governance is um, an interdisciplinary research uh, domain that um, really, really took off uh, around the World Summit on the Information Society. Uh, a lot of people have been uh, studying internet governance uh, through uh, legal, technological uh, means. Um, and um, uh, uh, recently, the terms around cybersecurity have become a little bit more uh, prominent. So within internet governance, you'll see that there are a range of cybersecurity uh, concerns that people are, are raising. So within the World Summit on the Information Society and um, its follow-up organization, the Internet Governance Forum, tremendous amounts of text-based data uh, has been generated. One of the nice things that um, has happened, as you know, I do work on accessibility. Uh, I'm the founding executive director of our Institute on Disability and Public Policy as well. So the fact that so many organizations are making transcripts available um, from their conferences or meetings um, is a real um, um, benefit for, for text mining. So in, in internet governance, we have those transcripts um, from uh, 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 at this point when I did this study, 12 years of the internet governance forum and continuing. But we have uh, organization and committee archives. There have been some really interesting internet governance uh, committees, uh, very, very high profile um, that uh, make their archives available. So their email mailing lists, uh, all of their meeting notes uh, and minutes uh, and a range of other blog posts and things like that. Uh, we also have reports and speeches, um, social media, uh, legal documents, treaties. So all kinds of text that's available for this area of, uh, of, of um, uh, internet governance research. So when we have access to this kind of uh, data, uh, it puts us in the realm of big data and we can talk about what that means and how we look at it. And we talk a lot about um, what we call the, the uh, relative nature of, of big data um, because text doesn't really take up much file size. So you can have an enormous amount of uh, text, but uh, it doesn't take up much file size. Um, and so uh, when we have this kind of a large scale data project, <clears throat> We, we manage our projects through this cross-industry standard process for data mining. Um, and so this is a pretty typical life cycle for a data mining project, uh, whether you use that term uh, or not. So starting first with thinking about what's the purpose of the study. And sometimes this is one of the hardest parts is to figure out how can all of this computational power that you have access to, how can it actually help you answer the questions for your study. So that you, you have to frame the, the problem that you're addressing and the questions very carefully so that the um, techniques that you're using uh, will help you answer those, those questions. Uh, you want to be familiar with the data that's available. So you want to identify and, and be able to bring that data in. And one of the things that I uh, like so much about um, uh, the Provales Pro Suite is its ability to handle um, a, a wide variety of data types um, where you can import uh, that data, whether you're talking about PDFs, HTML files, TXT files, um, social media files, email archives, uh, even in their inbox uh, format, um, a whole range of uh, data types can be brought in to the Provalis Pro Suite. Uh, many of those, um, uh, you can uh, harness the metadata uh, in those files to create variables as you import um, uh, the data. Uh, you also can uh, set up rules to be able to um, uh, create variables based on rules that you set up as you import um, that data. So um, that aspect uh, of the Pro Suite is, is really, really uh, phenomenal. Uh, once you have the data, you want to prepare it. Any data wrangling that you need to be able to do to get the data uh, into the format to be able to answer your questions and think about uh, in terms of assessing uh, 
the models, how are you going to answer these questions? How do you need to manipulate and formulate the data, get it into a structure where it's useful for you now to uh, deploy some of these techniques um, that uh, are available? Then you want to evaluate the findings and deploy the results, including making uh, recommendations to organizations, um, thinking about setting up dashboards where people can uh, have a series of metrics that they might want to use and look at, um, and then you know repeat the study if you need to, or look at future research. So that's sort of the standard process that we take when we manage uh, a large scale um, uh, project. And when we take a project like that, we think about these key inductive and deductive techniques. Um, and on the inductive side, you think about um, being given um, or having access to or scraping or however it takes um, a large text-based data set. And one of the questions that we might have is what's there? Um, what's, what's interesting and important uh, about this data set? So we start off with uh, some of the most dis uh, simple descriptive analysis doing um, uh, uh, keyword frequency analysis. Uh, we also employ uh, term frequency by inverted document frequency to try to identify those important uh, uh, words that are in a data set. Um, this can be uh, very, very powerful. Um, it's a simple technique. Um, the visualizations for this are simple. You've probably all seen word clouds and things like that and how frequently they're used to give you a sense of what's in a data set. And again, even though it's a simple technique, it's actually very, very powerful. Um, so this keyword uh, frequency analysis. Then we move to uh, key phrases. Um, so in, in Provalis, um, it's possible um, to be able to decide, do you want two word phrases, three word phrases, four word phrases, um, all of those at the same time. And so when you, um, when you um, uh, use that technique and you bring back those uh, key phrases, um, you now have all these, you know, from whatever you set up, two to four or five word uh, phrases. And some of the other uh, programming techniques, you, you talk about n-grams. So you do um, bigrams or trigrams or um, uh, different uh, number of phrases. And sometimes it's a little bit uh, tricky um, pulling those out um, each time as a bigram or a trigram. But in, in the pro suite, you can do all of that uh, at the same time. Uh, there are some other exploratory techniques, so entity extraction, uh, and actually in Provalis, uh, uh, phrases are, are under entity extraction, but you can do topic modeling, you can do named entity uh, recognition, so with topic modeling, you can set, um, uh, identify uh, a, a, a set number of topics um, that are in the data set, and anybody that's done uh, factor analysis in uh, traditional statistical analysis, you've, you've seen where uh, factor analysis can identify uh, out of a data set clusters of what it calls factors. Um, and so you see variables that um, sort of hang together and you have to interpret uh, what that factor represents. So in, um, in Provalis, uh, you can identify those uh, topics uh, or factors. And because we're using text, it actually gives you a, rec a, a suggestion of what that topic might be about. Um, and it's a really powerful uh, technique. Uh, on the name entity recognition, you can pull out uh, proper names and organizations and acronyms and locations, and it's really helpful for exploring a data set uh, as well. And there's some other uh, exploratory uh, techniques that you can use, and you can use them to uh, build uh, some of the hypotheses and um, to build some of the tools on the deductive side. So on the deductive side, we move to sort of confirmatory approaches. There are things that we're looking for or interested in exploring uh, within the data set. So I have on this side, one of the, again, simplest areas is to just think about um, some of those key uh, uh, exploratory techniques like phrase frequency or word frequency cross tabulated with some key variable. And so seeing how that changes over time or by organization or by uh, source of data or organization size, whatever might be uh, of interest to you, uh, region uh, globally or um, states within, within a country. Uh, something of that nature. But one of the most powerful techniques um, for us um, is categorization models. Um, and uh, in the industry, they usually are referred to as dictionaries or lexicons. Um, um, but I, I stick with uh, describing these as categorization models. This is the term that Provalis uses. And um, I think that it is very evocative uh, to help explain what a dictionary is able to do. Um, and it's to, it's to categorize uh, your text. 
uh, and essentially so that you're not looking at text and counting the individual words or, or phrases um, that are in your data set, but those words and phrases get aggregated into the categories of your dictionary. And so now you're counting the um, uh, uh, extent to which uh, those categories and subcategories are present uh, in your data set. And, uh, and I'll say this just kind of right off the bat, um, um, you know, I do a lot of text mining work every day, every week, and uh, I use a lot of tools um, for that. But one of the shining stars um, for me within the Provalis Pro Suite is the ability to um, both use existing uh, dictionaries, but to build uh, very complex uh, categorization models or, or dictionaries within Provalis. And we'll talk about how to do that uh, in a moment. Um, one of the other key uses of dictionaries um, that's very popular is uh, sentiment analysis, uh, where again, the, the two categories tends to be positive or negative. Um, and so you can aggregate up um, uh, uh, from a whole uh, huge um, uh, data set into just two categories. You know, to what extent is, is, is this text positive uh, or negative uh, in terms of sentiment? So those are some of the key uh, approaches that I wanted to uh, sort of lay the groundwork with. And let's talk a little bit more about dictionaries specifically, and then I'll give you some uh, examples. And some of this is drawn from some work that uh, Norman, uh, Dr. Pelladu and I, uh, along with our colleague, Mike Hind, um, have done uh, when we presented workshops uh, on text mining and, and papers and, and um, uh, mini tracks uh, at the uh, HICS conference, the Hawaii International Conference on System Sciences, we do uh, lead every year a workshop on text mining. Uh, if anybody happens to be interested in that uh, conference, we do have a workshop on text mining. Um, the last few years, it's uh, had a focus on both um, Provalis and on um, uh, text mining in, in R. Um, and uh, we lead a mini track uh, on text mining. So if you are um, uh, using your Provalis Pro Suite, uh, particularly WordStat to do uh, some analysis, this is an excellent um, target for your work uh, to submit to the Hicks conference. Um, it's a long uh, double blind peer review process. Uh, uh, papers are usually due in June. Um, and so you can start thinking about that. You have plenty of time uh, to uh, prepare for that. Uh, the, the next, the, the conference is always in January. So we encourage you to uh, participate with us in the January uh, conference. Uh, and see the papers that we have uh, accepted. But if you do want to submit your own, uh, you can look at uh, June as the as the target um, for for preparing for that. And I'll just say one other thing. Uh, another thing that I, I like about that is those who are interested in text mining, we uh, have been able to get a journal aligned with that mini track, um, the Journal of Data and uh, and um, and Politics, uh, Data and Policy. And so uh, papers that get accepted into the Hicks conference can have a fast track into um, uh, kind of a text mining component within that uh, journal. So back to categorization models, uh, also known as dictionaries or lexicons. Um, the idea for a dictionary is when you're looking for a concept. So this is a deductive approach. You're going into the data set looking for something specific and you wanna be able to detect the degree to which that something is present or absent in the data set. So the relative presence or absence of a concept uh, it could be a political concept, a linguistic concept. Uh, it could be um, uh, one of the things that we do uh, frequently is we think about uh, international treaty obligations and we look at what the requirements of those obligations are. And we want to see the extent to which those are represented uh, in a data set, for example. Uh, you can have dictionaries that are either domain independent or domain specific. Um, so domain independent would mean that you can take a dictionary and it's been developed in such a way that those concepts <laughs> can travel from corpus to corpus, um, uh, depending on uh, sort of irrespective of where the data is uh, coming from, because you're still looking for that particular concept. Or it could be domain specific, where the dictionary is able to really take advantage of um, a subject matter experts, uh, knowledge of and understanding of that particular domain. And so you can build a dictionary that is very specific to that particular domain and works really well on uh, a particular corpus that is, is well suited for, for that domain. Now, the challenge that uh, people will often say is, well, um, 
you know, should I build my own dictionary or should I uh, use one that already exists uh, or should I try to modify uh, an existing dictionary? And, and that's an open question and we can talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A. Uh, and the answer is that it varies. Um, so um, if you have uh, a, a, a team that has a deep level of uh, knowledge and subject, ma subject matter expertise, uh, if you have resources and if you have time, um, you, you really can build um, your own uh, dictionaries. Um, uh, you can build uh, relatively simple dictionaries, uh, or you can build very complex dictionaries. And again, um, this is where, for me, um, Provalis really stands out kind of hand in, hands and feet above many other techniques and in, in the ability to build uh, complex dictionaries with multiple uh, levels, uh, categories and subcategories, words and phrases and rules um, to be able to identify uh, um, and, and um, segment out uh, confusion uh, in words and phrases that you're looking for and, and dealing with this idea of polymorphy uh, in language. So you can use existing dictionaries as well. So there are a number of these ex existing dictionaries that are around. Uh, Provalis does a great job of aggregating um, a lot of these dictionaries on its website. Um, and uh, many of them are, are free to download and use. Uh, some of them are, um, uh, you are required to license uh, in order to use them. And if you look in that uh, last column there where it says dictionary structure, um, this gives you a sense of some of the, the complexity that can go into uh, a dictionary. So if you look at, um, say, uh, this um, uh, dictionary of rational and normative words in employee management techniques. So in that dictionary, you've got two big categories, but you've got 1,781 entries and 23 subcategories into those two categories. But remember what I said earlier, what a dictionary is going to be able to do is to allow you to not just um, not look at the individual words and phrases that are in your data set, um, which is, is easy to do in this sort of statistical text mining approach. But what this is going to do is to aggregate those words and phrases as they fit into these categories. So you can have a huge data set um, that you can go in and say, what are these two categories? Um, some of these have you know, thousands and thousands uh, of, of entries uh, in these various uh, subject matter oriented uh, dictionaries. So um, you know, uh, regressive imagery, job descriptions, uh, the, the in linguistic inquiry and word count, the loop dictionary, uh, dictionary of anti-elitism. So there are a range of these dictionaries um, that are possible. And uh, I, I, I wish that there were, was even a, a larger repository of these dictionaries that, um, that were available. So if you look at this uh, loop, the Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count Dictionary, it's got 6,400 words in it. And so if you look in Provalis and say, how do you build a dictionary like that? What does it look like under the hood? So it's, it's um, very easy to think about um, how do you build uh, a dictionary by starting with the top categories that you want to aggregate uh, up to. So in this case, the, the Luke has four big categories. So linguistic processes, psychological processes, personal concerns, and spoken categories. So these are the four categories that they're interested in in the loop. So for each of these, you can now think about, OK, if I focus on linguistic processes, what are some of the subcategories of that particular concept? And what are some of the subcategories of each of these other concepts? And you can keep doing that until you get down to um, the actual words and phrases. So this is what it looks like when you drill down. So you go back here one second. So you take psychological processes and then you can drill down into all of these subcategories of psychological processes. And then you can drill down uh, even further in one of those subcategories to the actual words and phrases. So if you look here, those words that you see there, um, uh, so accept, and the one after it means that anytime um, the word accept appears, it's going to weight that with a one and it's going to count it as positive emotion. Um, the accept with an asterisk after it, let me just pull up my, uh, my pin here. So the uh, accept with the asterisk after it means it's a wild card. So anything that starts with the letters A, C, C, E, P, T, A, anything after that, it's also going to count it. 
Um, and so um, you can build these dictionaries to capture all of these concepts that you wanna aggregate up to this idea of positive emotion. And again, if you go backwards, you, know, you can see that that um, uh, uh, affective process, uh, which is right here, is just one aspect, um, uh, positive emotion is just one aspect of this affective um, process, which is just one aspect of psychological processes, which is one aspect of this uh, category, uh, psychological processes. So you can see why the idea of calling this a categorization model or a categorization dictionary is so powerful because it's these categories that you're building, uh, building in. So the dictionary building process is uh, very challenging. Um, and as Mike uh, Hine has said, uh, it can be um, uh, difficult to do um, uh, properly uh, over time. So it requires both domain expertise and text analytic skills to be able to um, be effective and being able to leverage um, this tech technology. Um, there's not a lot of uh, documented prescriptive advice for these dictionaries. So Norman's um, uh, paper is, is, is one, um, and um, this paper by Bankston and Zhu, uh, and the paper, uh, several papers by uh, Mike Hine, uh, our colleague, uh, really helped to talk about this dictionary um, building process. But there's not a lot that's very prescriptive about how do you do it. So um, there's some best practices that uh, one can consider. Um, you can have uh, manual processes, or you can have automatic processes. And I'm gonna, not gonna spend a lot of time on this. We can come back and talk about this uh, a little bit later. I'd like to get to the uh, case study to make sure we can uh, talk about that um, within the time that we have. But uh, the point here is you can um, rely on some of the tools within WordStat to be able to help identify certain categories to certain identify certain themes. So you can build that from within the data set itself, or you can, um, um, build the dictionary based on uh, theory of what you're looking for um, in the data set. So uh, there are a range of tools that help you do this in the dictionary uh, development process. So clustering and topic modeling can help with that. Um, the frequently occurring words and phrases uh, can help you with that. Uh, identifying uh, named entities, as I said, people, places, persons, things, uh, acronyms, all of those could be built into a dictionary. Um, you can also use things like um, a, a thesaurus uh, or a database that helps you identify related words. Um, you also want to be able to identify uh, misspelled words and different ways of um, uh, using words and, and word inflection. So this um, dictionary development process, you know, starts from this uh, objective clarification, creating a corpus, pre-processing, identifying the categories, um, ex extension of the dictionary or simplifying the dictionary and then validating the dictionary uh, later. So um, let's talk a little bit now about uh, applying this uh, dictionary uh, in a particular uh, context. And in this context, um, as, as we were saying, you want to be able to have some level of uh, uh, expertise in that particular domain. And so for us, um, in this particular study, it came around the Internet Governance uh, Forum, uh, or also known as the IGF. Um, we um, published this study in our book on researching internet governance by MIT Press um, um, that came out uh, about a year or so ago. And the idea for the Internet Governance Forum is that this is uh, the kind of big international conference that uh, draws together uh, uh, public sector, private sector, international organizations, developing countries, um, civil society organizations from around the world. Uh, the IGF itself was established at the end of the World Summit uh, on the Information Society uh, and has been held every year since 2005. Um, obviously, the last uh, two years it's been held uh, remotely. So the IGF um, made a decision to make uh, transcripts available from all of its uh, conference. This was an accessibility feature, um, and they have made those transcripts available um, to the public. And so we wanted to be able to understand 12 years of these IGF uh, meetings. So we asked three um, high-level questions. Uh, each of these research questions gets broken down into sub-questions as we're trying to uh, understand this data set. And you can see that two of them 
are um, inductive oriented questions. So what are the key themes? What are the key topics and entities that are in this data set over uh, all 12 years? Uh, what issues have uh, remained the same and were consistent at the IGF and which ones have changed? And then we have a very nice um, uh, 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 deductive question where we're asking uh, to what extent does a particular model, in this case, the NIST cybersecurity model, is that uh, represented in the transcripts from the IGF? Um, so this is a deductive question using a dictionary to be able to uh, analyze it. So we had 1,020 transcripts uh, from uh, 2006 to 2017. Uh, as I mentioned, these uh, transcripts uh, were in a variety of formats. Uh, some were PDFs, some were text files, some were HTML files. So um, uh, within uh, uh, the Probalis Pro Suite, you can import all three of those formats um, simultaneously with no, no real problem. Um, and so uh, we were able to bring all of those uh, in. And now you can start to look at um, some of these inductive techniques. What are some of the key themes? You see human rights as a key theme, freedom of expression, developing countries, um, keywords such as cybersecurity, uh, women, uh, 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 blockchain. Uh, you can look at hierarchical cluster analysis and you can start to see some very clear clusters that are emerging within this data set. So if you look on the left hand side, you can see um, a cluster on um, uh, child sexual abuse, uh, pornography maybe is one cluster. Um, you look here as kind of an infrastructure uh, cluster and far here on the right, a cluster on smart cities and uh, Internet of Things. We can also see which of these issues have stayed the same uh, and which ones have changed over the years. We can explore um, you know, those uh, issues. Um, so we can see from 2008 to 2007, you know, which of these issues uh, remain the same. But we can also use a categorization model. We can use a dictionary to uh, explicitly look at this cybersecurity framework. So um, if you go back to this um, process of how do you build a dictionary, so we went to the um, NIST cybersecurity uh, 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 framework and built a categorization model from it. And we talk about these as complex multi-level models. And I want to just explain this just a little bit. So um, in 2014, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology uh, in the US um, released this cybersecurity model. And this was a model to be able to identify uh, and assess the degree to which uh, an organization was prepared in terms of cybersecurity. So it had uh, five uh, top level categories. So identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Um, for each of those, there were subcategories. So with identify, for example, there was asset management um, and uh, business environment, risk assessment, risk management, and governance. Within um, each of those subcategories, there were sub subcategories to be able to identify things like physical devices, software, uh, or organizational communications and data uh, and so forth. So then um, at the lowest level of the categorization model, you're putting in uh, words and phrases that you're looking for. And as I mentioned, if there's a phrase that's particularly relevant, you can weight that phrase um, and, and weight it uh, at a higher level, but you can also put in rules and the rules are able to say, uh, if you find this word or this phrase, but not in the presence of this other word or within the presence of this other word, or um, only within uh, when this other word occurs in the same paragraph, or there, there's just a, a, a wide variety of rules that you can build into um, a dictionary. Now, some people um, who build dictionaries really don't like the rules because once you start to go down uh, that um, rabbit hole, so to speak, it really um, um, adds to the time that it takes to, to build a dictionary. But I believe that it really helps to um, further um, sharpen the concept that you're looking for uh, in the data set. Uh, and uh, when you're going through the validation process, this is one of the areas that you want to really be thinking about is, um, are you pulling out uh, from the data set what you think you are as you're looking at these categories. So we built this um, dictionary, this categorization model, and we applied it to all 12 years of the IGF um, data set. And so what we were able to find once we did that first was um, 
across all 12 years, where was the effort uh, placed? So uh, clearly on the identify side and the protect side, less on the other uh, three categories. Now, we've done something like this um, with a, another big project where we were looking at the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And we wanted to understand um, uh, to what extent were countries putting in place uh, the uh, recommendations and the, the concerns that were in the, the treaty. And we built a, a model, a categorization model around the treaty and the um, uh, accepted indicators of those components of the treaty and applied it in a similar way. So there's some, we can, we can talk about, there's some really, really interesting ways to apply um, these categorization models. But in this case, um, you can drill down just a little bit more and look at the subcategories and see where the effort was placed. So in this case, and it was placed on the subcategory uh, of the business environment, as well as awareness and training, uh, and then access control. And then you can get down to the sub subcategory level um, and actually start to figure out where uh, the attention is being paid within this data set from the NIST cybersecurity model. But more importantly, um, and if you had some hypotheses about, uh, well, I think they're gonna be focusing on third party stakeholder issues, and you saw this um, uh, data visualization, you begin to think or have some sense that, you know, maybe in fact, those are the two areas that uh, attention is being, being paid. But for us, um, and this is kind of a sanity check for the, the model, um, we wanted to see, to look over time to see um, how this model, uh, was this model, the extent to which this model was present or absent over time. And so we did a, um, a kind of a longitudinal look. And if you go back to 2008, um, some of the early transcripts, you see that there was very little uh, inclusion of the kind of concepts uh, that are in the NIST framework uh, as measured by our dictionary. Um, but in 2014, which is when the, diction the um, model was released, you see a sharp jump in at least two of the areas uh, from the uh, model. So that there's a correlation between the introduction of the model and a discussion of the components of the model uh, within the Internet Governance Forum and so that lets us um, uh, gives us some sense that these issues are in fact uh, the issues in our um, dictionary are in fact present uh, in this in this data set. So um, I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions because I would prefer that more than uh, me speaking at you and see what questions I might be able to answer. Okay. Tony, are you gonna, yeah, I was going to say, if you're going to monitor uh, the Q&A and help me with yeah, that. Yeah, 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 no, I, I won't make you read. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll pull out the questions for you. So if you have questions, please use the chat feature um, and send, send your questions and I'll pick the one, I'll, I'll, I'll relay them to, um, to Derek. Uh, so, Derek. So Tony, there is one that's here right now. I can uh, take that one while you look at the others. Please go ahead. So uh, this is from Stephanie, and it says, do you need to build the rules in the dictionaries, or can you create dictionaries with the key concepts and terms? And I, I, it looks like I might have answered that along the way. Um, so you don't have to build the rules, Stephanie. Uh, and in fact, most people who build dictionaries don't use the rules, and, um, and, and those dictionaries are quite powerful in, in their own right, just using the words and phrases. Um, you can also, uh, you have to make a decision of do you want to allow the, the uh, any overlap so that the words and phrases can be used in more than one category. So within uh, Provalis, you can click a checkbox and say, yes, allow overlap or no, don't allow overlap. Uh, and that'll give you a little bit further uh, distinction in where that category, uh, where that word goes or which category that word uh, goes into. Uh, I'm pretty comfortable most of the time allowing that uh, overlap, but that's a, that's a choice that you, um, would have to make. So most people are quite comfortable with dictionaries that uh, are only using uh, the words and, and, and phrases, but I, I do like um, to, to build the rules. But as I, as I gave a, a little warning there, Stephanie, it, it, it definitely takes you down uh, a rabbit hole and, and a lot more work goes into it. Okay, uh, a question actually about uh, the, the conference. Is the conference this year uh, going to be virtual? Um, 
uh, as well as probably in person or both, or do you know? Um, so if we're talking about the uh, Hicks conference. The yes, Hicks we, conference, yes, we are. Yeah, the Hicks conference is going to be virtual, unfortunately. You're, you're sticking a, a knife in my heart there, Tony. Uh, <laughs> so it will be uh, virtual this year, which should make it a little bit more accessible to more people. Um, it's usually in, in January, the early part of January, and it moves around um, between um, uh, the Kauai, Maui, uh, and the Big Island. Um, and um, it's the University of Hawaii Manoa Business School that, that puts it on. Um, but we would love for you to be able to participate uh, virtually this year and start thinking about submitting a paper, um, which would be due in June of next year. Okay. Now, I have a question that I'm going to ask Norma, uh, if that's okay, Derek. It's, mm -hmm. also, it's also from Stephanie. Um, Norma, you, you can open your mic, Tath. There you go. Okay. Yes. Stephanie <laughs> says, we've built several, several uh, you might be interested in this as well, Derek, of course. We've built <laughs> several domain-specific dictionaries using SPSS text analytics for surveys. IBM no longer supports that product, and I'm looking for a potential replacement. Would the Provalis product be able to read those? And then she further adds, she went and looked and she said the file extension is .lib. Okay, um, I have no idea what the LIB file looked like, but uh, what I suggest is that you send us um, one, or, one or, or a few of those files so that we can look at that. And if you still have access to the software, maybe we could find a way, if, if we cannot read those files directly, Maybe we can find uh, a way, another way to export that and make sure that you move what you got into WordSat. But it, I have no idea what it involved. I would need to look at the, the, the data file itself. So, so send that to us, send that to support with this question, uh, or, or, or Tony can contact you and, and ask you for, for at least one of the file, ideally more than one, okay? Yeah, uh, Stephanie, you've got my email. It's tony.ross at provalisresearch.com. And I'll also reach out to you uh, afterwards. Derek, um, how do you treat mixed language uh, sources when using a dictionary? For example, some sources in French and others in English within the same project. So that's a that's a, an ongoing question and one that we've we've wrestled with a lot. Um, First of all, let me just step back and say one of the things that is so nice about text mining is that um, you can do text mining in multiple languages without having to translate all the documents first. Um, essentially, what you can do is, is do a lot of the analysis on the, on the documents, uh, look at your results, and then get your results translated. Uh, and sometimes that, you know, may mean, you know, translating, you know, 10, 15, 20 words, as opposed to, you know, 100, 200, 300 documents. Um, so, uh, you know, that's one of the real values of, of, of text mining. In terms of dictionaries, the way we've handled it is, unfortunately, we've had to build uh, a, a, dic a language specific dictionary. So we have a big project right now, where we're looking at um, uh, COVID responses um, national uh, COVID responses. And uh, we had a, have a global stratified sample of countries, uh, including a stratification by language. And so we have quite a bit of data in French. And so we have built both a English model for the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and a French model uh, uh, for the same uh, uh, thing. Now that was a bit tricky. Uh, we, we built the English model first uh, and it's a really comp it's the most complicated model that we've ever built um, because it um, is trying to so in in the so the first time I built a model in that space um, uh, I, I have a book back here somewhere right that one right there in the middle where we were looking at in, uh, um, uh, implementing the convention in Southeast Asia and so we had research teams on the ground looking at the elements of Article 33 of the convention. So when we wanted to do a global survey of implementing the convention, we built a model that looked at Article 33, which has three components. And so we wrote um, the dictionary to address those three components, a, a cross-governmental collaboration, a, an independent human rights mechanism that meets the Paris principles, and multi-stakeholder participation, including 
organizations for persons with disabilities. So we wrote that rule and then we applied it to the state party reports. And so it was really excellent to see that there had been a lot of attention placed on the governmental collaboration, very little but some on the, on the Paris principles and very little on the um, um, uh, uh, multi-stakeholder participation. But that was just writing it from our subject matter expertise based on that book of what it meant to implement Article 33. But in this model, um, we looked at all 50 uh, articles in the convention. So the convention has 50 articles and each article may have you know, two, three, four, five paragraphs. And so it's a lot of substance in each of those articles. And then there's a, a global um, uh, consortium that has come up with accepted indicators for each of those components uh, of the convention. And so we built the model based on those globally accepted indicators. So now you've got this hugely complicated multi-level uh, model that also needed to be translated into French. So we started with the English and then we had uh, native French speakers work on uh, translating that model uh, into French so that we would make sure we were picking up all of the French uh, documents as well. So, um, you know, there's, there's that for me, I think that's good news and bad news on the multilingual front because you can certainly uh, do text analysis without having to translate the documents. But in terms of dictionaries, that's the approach that we took. Um, okay, you touched on it in, in, in your answer to that question, but um, and and maybe there is much to expand but but some, somebody is asking us sort of a an extension to that maybe a little bit um first of all he says thank you for the excellent presentation um if if there are notions i wanted to know or to understand if there are notions of validating a dictionary through any sort of external concert consultation with literature, peer review, colleagues. I'm trying to understand what are the standard practices in this regard? I think you touched on it a little bit. Maybe you want to expand on it. Yeah, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more. And that's that's one of those $64,000 questions um, is, is how do you do that? And I'll, I'll, I'll say a few things um, and there's, there's more. Um, so one of the things is you want to make sure that what the dictionary is pulling out and aggregating is what you think it is, and is what should be aggregated, um, and you know into those into those categories. So you can do things like pull out uh, keywords in context or or quick within uh, within uh, WordStat to be able to see what is what um, uh, words uh, or phrases are occurring before the words and phrases that you have in the dictionary, and after the words and phrases you have in the dictionary. And you can use that to figure out, are there instances of um, the concept that I'm looking for that are being uh, aggregated into this category that should not be? And if, if so, can I identify what is it about the way that those preceding and following words um, uh, are there that I can take advantage of? So again, if you see that if this phrase that you have in the model um, is preceded by not, let's say, to negate it, then you might say, OK, don't count that. Um, so you can write a rule that says don't count that if it's preceded by this word or if it's followed by this word. So the, the keyword in context can really help you uh, do that. Another validation technique that we've used is, uh, again, and this goes back to being able to have some level of subject matter expertise, is to say, um, I know what uh, you might do a, a close read of a sample of the documents. And so, or, or again, if you know the, the, you know, the documents very well, you might say, I know that, you know, there was a, a discussion of this um, um, concept in the data. Did the model pull it out or not? And if the model didn't pull it out, you can now go back and look at that discussion and say, I wonder what it is about the way um, this particular way of talking about the concept didn't get captured by the model and you can tweak the model to make sure it captures um, that way of thinking about the concept. Um, you know, I, I've sort of described, I've frequently talked about um, uh, a dictionary development as creating a semantic model of a concept. Um, and so if you have an example that you know exists in the data set um, and you can tell if the model is pulling it out or not, 
um, that's a way of, of, of validating uh, your model. Um, there's certainly other ways to do this. Um, you know, so you can work with um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, key informants. So you know, once you do the analysis and you pull these uh, components out and you present that to um, you know a key informant who was a part of the process who or who has additional subject matter expertise to see if there's um, if if what you're finding with the model is um, you know in keeping with their um, uh, understanding or experience as well. It's a it's a challenging concept uh, in terms of the validation uh, process. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh kind of a, a little more basic but um I, I think it's it's important just to touch on it or hear what you have to say about it uh, can a dictionary be used across dorm domains in order to draw more insights or is it best for one dictionary per domain what do you uh or, or is it a little bit of can you be a little bit pregnant i guess is sort of <laughs> you I, I think in this in this case you can um so um, and and it can also cause problems. So so let me go 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 back to this study of um, the the CRPD again. Well, let me let me answer the question first. Is um, the answer is both. Um, so um, I think that there are really good uh, cross-domain dictionaries that can be built that are extremely useful, and that's why you know if you see a listing there of all those dictionaries. You know they can certainly be used um, um, because of the work that's gone into building and in some cases like the last question uh, validating those dictionaries uh, but um, it's it's quite likely that you're not going to find a dictionary that uh, meets all of your needs it's just like using any secondary data as opposed to primary data you might not find a dictionary that meets your needs specifically and so in that case you really do need to go through the effort of you know, trying to build the domain specific uh, dictionary. So again, in our case, um, the uh, CRPD um, uh, dictionary that we built for the whole CRPD, you know, that is a really good model for some uh, um, uh, corpuses. So uh, I think that that model works really well on the state reports where it's a very, uh, domain specific corpus. It's around what countries are saying they're doing in terms of implementing the CRPD and the projects that they worked on. And so this model works really well, I think, in that context. Um, it, you know, we, what we've applied it to in some of the broader policy responses and so forth, um, you know, it, it was not exactly, you know, it wasn't built for that frame, that, that environment. And so it was a little harder. There were instances of um, where there was a bit of a mismatch. Um, and it's a great question because as we went into that specific domain, there were more COVID related specific things that we wanted to, to pull out that were not in the domain independent dictionary. Um, and we still used it, but then we started building some smaller domain specific dictionaries for the COVID project itself. Okay, thank you. Um, I keep wondering, not me, but the questioner, I keep wondering if the frequency with which things occur simply just tells us how prevalent they are. How do we go from from that to other insights such as important, so how important something is? How can we control for things like different authors who are more verbose on one topic than another? Does this tell us anything meaningful other than what exists in the text? I suppose a sh we're getting there. A short way of asking the question is, how do we work out why something is in the text rather than just what is in the text? Well, it's a, it's a great question. It's, it's you know, certainly um, one that um, people raise all the time. Um, and my answer is um, every technique um, um, has its strengths and every technique has its limitations and no technique can do everything. Um, so it depends on what kinds of questions you're trying to ask and what kinds of questions you want to answer. Um, and in some cases, this is not the most appropriate technique for some of the questions you might want to uh, answer. It's not a, a silver bullet that's going to solve any um, problem you have that you could get from text. So that just has to be clear from the beginning. Uh, but there are a number of ways to get at things that are important um, uh, in text and not just that they occur uh, frequently. 
Um, so, you know, there are ways, uh, for example, um, so the, the heuristic of TF-IDF, for example, so, so term frequency is going to give you things that are important because they um, uh, occur frequently. And this is part of what's called the bag of words approach. So in text mining, there's these two big um, divisions between uh, natural language processing and, and statistical text mining. And statistical text mining uses this bag of words approach, which um, uh, essentially puts all of the words from the corpus into a big bag, um, you know, separate, I see some of the other questions separated out by documents that is important to be able to know who was saying what or which, you know, do document um, uh, did it come from and using those as variables and so forth. So term frequency is going to say, well, the terms that occur frequently are important, right? So that's one way of looking at it, which is what the questioner uh, is asking. But there's a heuristic that is pretty accepted in the industry called TF-IDF. So it's term frequency by inverted document frequency. So it's terms that appear frequently, but not too frequently. Um, and so those are uh, generally thought of as um, more important from that concept, but that's the simplest way to do this kind of analysis. So it's not just about frequency. In, in that instance, it's about term frequency or inverted document frequency, but that's on the simplest end of the spectrum. There are a whole range of other techniques that are not just about what is occurring frequently. So topic modeling, for example, is not about the frequency with which something is uh, occurring um, or cl clustering. Um, this is about the relationships between those words or those variables uh, within the data set. Um, topic modeling uh, is a very, very powerful technique to identify key topics uh, within a data set that's not just it's occurring frequently. Now, of course, you've got to still do the heavy lifting. You've got to understand what do these mean? What does this mean within the context of the data set and so forth? So there's no silver bullet. You're just going to push a button and, and it's going to give you all the insights. You, you still have to do the work. Okay, you touched on it because I think you saw this question. You've been cheating. You've been looking at the screen. Um, <laughs> uh, is it better to split documents before importing? Uh, do, do, did you import a document for each forum? So um, again, one of the things I like about these tools is that um, you can um, um, you can you can be very very flexible. You can take in almost any kind of data. So whatever format you get it in, um, you can work with it in that format. So you can go back later and split it if you wanted to. Um, so if you had a document, so we had a, we had a really interesting project once where there was one. Um, my right, gosh, I'm getting old. <laughs> there was a, there's a, do, a government document in the US that lists um, organizations that are on the terrorist watch list or something like that. And their funds are being uh, held, or I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was a, whole, a huge document that just had these sort of small paragraphs, each one for an organization. And, and in that paragraph, there was a set of codes for each um, organization that would tell you details about that organization. And that was in one document. So what we did was we were able to write, um, so when you import uh, data into uh, um, QDA minor or um, directly into WordSat, I think you can do this directly into WordSat. I, I usually use the whole pro suite. Um, uh, QDA minor is a CACDAS tool, uh, computer assisted qualitative data analysis software where you are expected uh, to do the reading and to kind of uh, tag uh, certain concepts. And we can come back to that a little bit later, but um, I, I use the whole suite. So I like bringing in my data and managing my project from uh, QDA minor uh, rather than necessarily managing it in WordStat, which you can absolutely do uh, if, if you're just using WordStat. But um, uh, so I think this happens in both QDA minor and WordStat, Norman can correct me, but uh, when you import the data, you can, if you, if, you, if you look at the data and you uh, can identify patterns and themes. So for example, um, in that book that I'm, I'm sorry, in that uh, document that I'm talking about, and I'm gonna make this up, I can't remember, but let's say it started with name and then a colon, and then it had a return. And then it had you know, a couple of set of codes, and then it had some text. Well, if, if that structure is in, the, is in the data set itself, you can capitalize on all of that and create variables from all of that and split that the, each one of those 
into its own document as you bring it in. And the reason uh, that that is valuable is um, you want to be able to compare across documents. It's kind of like each, each of those documents could be uh, a case or could be like a respondent or could be uh, part of other documents that you build for a particular case. So you, you frequently are going to want to do that, but you don't, don't have to. But let me just continue this particular point. So when we did that, if you look at that structure, you can write it and it's, and it's pretty straightforward. It's nowhere near as complicated as writing a regular expression, for example, that would capture the same thing. So you can say, um, you know, when there is a, uh, the, 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 the word name uh, followed by a colon, take everything after that and store that in a variable called name. And then take everything on the next line up to the, if there, again, if there's some structure up to the next colon and put that in as the codes and then put everything up to the next, um, uh, you know, double bullet, uh, you know, then call that a case. And so you could do that on import and create all of those cases and create all those variables as you imported the documents uh, into your project. Did I answer that question? I think I did. I think you did. I, I think you did. Um, this question gets asked almost all the time when we're talking about dictionaries. I, and um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, to, I think, I mean, I know the answer, but um, yes, he said, thank you, perfect. You answered the question. Um, and, and, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, is there anywhere to go, or maybe the question's better asked, how do you find existing dictionaries? You know, Provalis, we have on our on, on WordStat on our website, a number of different dictionaries um, mm -hmm. that have been built um, that we either give for, provide for, for free when you get the software, or some of them you can, like the Hillary, you can pay a nominal fee to get it. Um, is there any way to, if you're starting to, in a particular field to search for dictionaries or? There is, and, and, and that, you know, all of you out there, this is an opportunity. If you're an entrepreneur, there's some, this needs to be done. Um, so as far as I know, the best place to aggregate those has been the Provalis website. And I appreciate that you have all, you guys have all done that, um, but there are other ways. So um, if you search the literature, um, and you search for dictionary, um, you know, text mining dictionary, um, lexicon, um, you might find articles that have used a dictionary. So published articles or reports that have used a dictionary. And then frequently in their um, uh, footnotes or in their citations or references, they, they might point you to a website where they're either making that dictionary available uh, or um, licensing that dictionary. Uh, or something like that. So we started to build our own little collection of dictionaries, um, but it's it's going very slowly. <laughs> so uh, if somebody can can crack that, it would be it would be uh, great. <laughs> uh, Norma just chimed in and in, in, in they said, "Yeah, do a Google Scholar search." And I, I guess what about? I've tried this a couple of times with limited success, sometimes success, sometimes not. What about trying to contact the people that wrote the papers directly and say, I'd like to, I'm working in the field and uh, I'd like to, would you share your dictionary so I can use it as a basis to start on mine? Does that work? Yeah. Absolutely, I think it would absolutely work. Um, you know, people, you know, put a lot of time and energy into their dictionaries, for example. So the, the, the CRPD dictionary, for example, that we've developed, we're not ready to let that uh, be available to the public yet because we're still using it. Um, and, uh, you know, but at some point, um, me like other uh, authors would be willing to, to share that as long as it gets uh, cited and, and um, you know, re referenced appropriately. Okay, and uh, of course, as, as you said on the, off the top of the, uh, the earlier answer to the question, um, if you have dictionaries, anybody out there has dictionaries or knows of dictionaries, um, we are happy to, uh, to host them on our website. I mean, we do take a look at them and Norma looks through them to make sure they're, they're robust dictionaries. But um, we, and we've also reached out to people who have done papers and said, would you mind sharing your dictionary? And we put it on our website and we usually, um, you know, give somebody a, 
you know, a thank you, let me put it that way, for um, a, a concrete thank you in terms of put it, hosting the dictionary uh, on, on our website. Um, there are a few other questions, Derek, but they're very specific to you. I suggest people who have some of these questions like um, to, to get in contact with, uh, with Derek, so there's questions about somebody wants different, there we go, there's your contact information. For people who are looking for you know, specific examples of certain things, or you have more specific questions to Derek, get in contact with him directly. Um, we're, a bit, we're past the time, um, but thank you very much. Do you have any final comments uh, before we uh, head off? I just want to say uh, thank you, Tony, once again for for hosting this and for inviting me. Um, it is uh, you know always great to 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 share some of the things that I'm spending all my time doing. So and that there are other people who care about it. So uh, so I appreciate that. Um, you know, as I said earlier, this is an exciting time for a text miner. Um, you know, one of the problems is that there's so much data around you. You 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 know you just start to see all of these potential projects that you could do. And so uh, I'm a big uh, person who likes to collaborate. So look for friends and collaborators who can uh, can work with you. And as uh, as we said earlier, you know, we we encourage you to participate in our uh, community that we're building around text mining and the Hicks conference. So uh, please do keep that in mind. And you can attend virtually. Do you, have, do you have to pay to attend virtually? I don't know. You did in the past. Um, I'm not sure how they're planning to do it this year. Okay. Anyway, you can go to the website and, and find out, or you can email Derek and he'll put you on the list or send you to the right people to find <laughs> out. Thank you very much, Derek. As informative as always, uh, for, the, for all of you listening, uh, we're recording this session. Um, we will be posting it on the webinar section of our website probably by early next week. It takes us a few days sometimes to turn this around. But um, thank you very much, very much appreciated. Please take a look at, we don't have any other Lunch and Learn scheduled right now, but as I said, we're hoping to have a couple of more before the holidays. So please uh, take, you know, subscribe to our newsletter. You can do that through the website. Take a look at us on social media and um, we hope to uh, see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Derek. You're welcome. Take care, everybody. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for the lecture, please, Professor David.